We often hear that diversity, equity, and inclusion matters to businesses, but their data tells a different story. So what is the missing piece? On Finding Diversity, we tell real stories of what has worked for others and provide experiences that will inspire you. I'm Justice Thompson, and this is where our journey begins. Welcome to the latest episode of Finding Diversity, The Missing Piece. Today, we are joined by special guest, Kenneth Shropshire. Professor Shropshire has had an extensive career in academia, having founded and led the Wharton Sports Business Initiative and led the sports-focused executive education program. He also served as CEO of the Global Sports Initiative at Arizona State University, where he was the Adidas Distinguished Professor of Global Sports. Currently, he has returned to the University of Pennsylvania, where he is launching and leading Wharton's Coalition on Diversity and Opportunity. We are thrilled to have Professor Shropshire on the show today to share his insights and experience in advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion across industries. I'm your host, Justice Thompson. Let's get started. Kenneth, thank you for being here. Thank you, Justice. Good to be here. I have to say, I was super intimidated to have this uh, have this podcast because looking at your resume, <laughs> it is daunting that you have done a little bit of everything. It is amazing to have you here. So thank you so much for, for being here. You know, that's about justice, right? That's, that's being old. That's, 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 that, you know, well, you, you can do a lot of things when you're old. Well, I'm excited to learn from you today. So we start with this kind of cape you exercise. So I'll kick us off. It's one thing about your younger self, one thing about your culture and something unique about you. So I'll start. Um, one thing about my younger self is when I was really young, uh, just learning how to speak. I really liked Winnie the Pooh, apparently. And when Winnie the Pooh said, ta-ta for now, uh, there was an umbrella. Uh, that Christopher Robbins would hold. So I thought umbrellas were called Tata. So I would call umbrellas Tata for now, which really, really confused my parents. But that's something uh, about my younger self. Uh, one thing I like about my culture is kind of sports. I think uh, being an athlete, playing college athletics, I think the family ended up being why, uh, like that, that co uh, co camaraderie of being with my fellow uh, football players is actually why I kept playing football in college because I was more injured than I was actually playing. But it was that that brotherhood that I think kept me playing uh, in sports and kept me kind of engaged in football. Um, one thing unique about me that most people don't know is I actually really, really love design. You can kind of see behind me here. These are some artwork I've done with my partner that we really, really uh, have enjoyed. And I really like kind of graphic design, something unique about me that, that most people don't know. And with that said, I will hand it over to you, Kenneth. All right. So, so uh, audience, this is all like first impression. I haven't had a big, uh, long period of time to rehearse and think about this. And somehow this has been on my mind about my youth. Um, uh, in a kind of impressionable moment that I didn't really know was happening when it happened. But I, my brother and I, uh, and actually uh, the Ajais, Eric and Franklin Ajai, we integrated this elementary school in LA. We'd all lived in a, previously in a you know, black neighborhood and, and moved to what, what is now actually, it's the Crenshaw district, Baldwin Hills kind of over there, which you, know, you wouldn't think of being a white segregated area. But I remember uh, going or planning to go on a play date with a kid, I guess a second grade or so, and uh, it never happened. And my mother showed up and, and picked me up. And years later, she told me, my mother, that what had really happened, and my mother had the foresight and was kind of the protector in this way throughout her life. My mother said that she had a feeling something would go wrong and she saw the kid's mother see who i was get her kid in the car drive off and i would have been left there alone then you know it's not really impact it was kind of a mystery to me what happened yeah. my mother shared that with me uh some years later so that's one wow thank you for uh is there a couch somewhere I can lay down on? <laughs> that and, was amazing. Story. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> like that, those type of stories, it just, it reminds me of a lot of the stories my, my grandpa would tell me about growing up. He, he drove the bus after he graduated high school, like for the, for the other kids. Like he drove the bus yeah. to and from school. I think, uh, thank you for sharing that. That's awesome. Wow. So, so culture, 
if I got the question right. Yeah. Um, uh, barbecue. I'm like a big, and this kind of blends into the, the next question. I'm a big barbecue fan, but this is kind of my, my parents are from uh, Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Texas. My father actually was born in Texarkana, so he claims both, both states. So barbecue was always a big part of our life in, in L.A. They actually built at the two homes we had in L.A., two different homes, brick barbecue pits. So uh, that's always kind of a, a big part of what we do. And it's a, it's a you know, you're talking about the sport as a, and I, I could have, I didn't want to steal your sports thing, but I could have used sports as a, as a way that uh, I really stay connected with people I've known for years. But there's, there's a whole core of people that I've barbecued with and you know, invite for barbecue. And that's something, something that we do. And I, yeah, I still, I, I am that guy. You wonder when you get way on the far end of the cable and there's all these barbecue shows. I am the guy that will sit and watch some of those. Or some of you people watch Gunsmoke or Mash, and that's the, I will sit and watch watch barbecue shows. So, uh, so that's that one. Now, what the third one? Something something you, unique about you? Yeah, something people might not know exactly. Something unique about me. Well, you gave all that, that glorious uh, stuff about me. Um, well, yeah, I'm thinking of two different things, but uh, but I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one that that. Uh, uh, definitely is impactful and, and maybe could have been the answer for the first question too. Um, I took, uh, back in my day, you would take driver's training in, in high school. So now, so I'm at high, so I've got elementary school and now I'm going to do high school. So, <laughs> so, uh, and used to do it, uh, in this case, the actual driving in the car was on Saturday mornings and there were some kids from some other schools that would come to our high school, Dorsey high school to, uh, to do this. And, and, um, so one, one Saturday, one of the kids that was normally in the car didn't show up. Hmm. And, uh, when I got home, my mother shows me the, the newspaper and says, isn't this, isn't this the kid that was in your car? And this kid, uh, Robert Blue actually was one of the first, uh, kids, uh, killed by the Crips, kind of like on the modern era Crips in 1972 over a leather jacket. Uh, the, and it's, it, you know, the, the story is a little bit unclear whether or not he would give up his, he wouldn't give his up to these guys or uh, he was trying to protect another guy, but he, he got killed, got stomped to death. And that was, um, I think we were in the 11th grade. It was like a, a life changing moment in terms of the way we would got to move around the city of, of LA, which, uh, which was, uh, you know, in, in the early seventies was certainly a, you know, a car city and we would move around a lot. We would, we used to wear until that moment, leather jackets, all that kind of, it's kind of early Panther kind of time. <laughs> uh, uh, but we stopped wearing those cause that became kind of a, um, something that people would fight for. <laughs> and and did, did you, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, my, my identity at that time was mainly that of athlete and not, not gangster, but if you wanted to engage, you would wear these leather jackets. So, so that, that's, that's one of the, and there, you know, years later, I mean, it, it was kind of apocryphal. We, we, we thought that's what happened. We would talk about years later, there's a couple of specials, uh, you know, documentary type things, you know, now that we get every, every movie ever made that talk about this this night, I think it was at the Hollywood Palladium in LA that this happened. And it's just, just striking that that was like one of the first uh, big killings that reinvigorated because the, the Crips and Bloods had been around in different forms, but this was a 70s re reinvigoration just prior to the, uh, the crack cocaine time. So, well, um, I, so I here are my, those are my stories. No, they, they, thank you for sharing. That's a, that's amazing. Like I think I think our listeners and our viewers especially like will will be blown away by that. That is, that is awesome. I do think it, it raises an interesting question of, of what you just said that I, maybe we can dive into first, which is sure. this intersection between uh, like sports doesn't exist in a vacuum, right? You kind of talk about being an athlete during that time period. Tell me more about that. I think that's something we like to think is that somehow athletes, and especially with kind of what's going on, I think most recently news with John Morant that kind of sports exists in this vacuum. Tell me a little bit more about kind of uh, your background in sports and how that kind of informs and intersects with diversity, equity, and inclusion. 
Yeah, that's a, I hadn't even thought about it like that. It's the first time I've, I've thought about my life with, in conjunction with John Morant. But, um, you know, it, it is, I, I do think about this kind of transition period. I mean, I talked about, you know, when I'm in elementary school, so we moved into this white neighborhood and almost overnight white flight occurs and becomes this black neighborhood, the Crenshaw district, you know, the, the, the you know, the, sort of all the Crenshaw and Slauson kind of uh, conversations, the boys in the hood, all that stuff. That, that's what it became. Um, so I was kind of in and out of, of, of that moment. And when, by the time I got to, to high school, it was this, you know, largely black neighborhood. We had, had one white guy on, on the team uh, who, you know, outrageously and apropos of this show, we called snow, you know, how, <laughs> how inappropriate is that? But, you know, these are the kinds of things you look back on. So what were you we thinking of? Why did we think that was right? And Snow, Snow may have actually been his name, though. That's, that's the one thing I keep <laughs> holding on to. And nobody seems to, to be able to, to reach to that. But, but the, the, you know, that, those teams in that school, uh, especially in that moment, did consist of uh, a lot of great uh, kind of families striving to be successful kind of um, uh, migrants to the west coast you know, la the place of opportunity so so those kinds of families um but there, there was this this moment of this kind of gang activity that i mentioned that that permeated where we were we had a, a kid um his name's james miller he's passed away and i'll kind of tell the story of, of as i understand it what, what happened to him um they came a big kid uh you know as i look back he came in as a, I think, ninth or tenth grader, just a big, oversized kid, one of the first uh, um, heterosexual men, uh, I will say, uh, that was not a merchant marine to have an earring that that, that we knew of. It was a kid with it with an earring, and we're like, wow, this, you know, so 1972, he's wearing an earring. So think about that. When did that moment begin? Where it began? Yeah. Where people were wearing earrings and and it became the case that you are gang affiliated. That's the, the kind of the first move in from, you know, we, we would see people in the neighborhood. It was they, oh, he crossed, he crossed the international date line. That's why he's able to wear an earring. And, and then all of a sudden it was this gang affiliation. Um, but this, this kid uh, was a great player and I ended up uh, getting in trouble and had to transfer schools and we played against him. Long story short, he ends up, uh, getting incarcerated and um you know it, it, a couple of instances where he had weapons around us so 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 as you ask what kinds of things did you encounter one time some dispute broke out and he uh pulled a weapon out and aimed it at the bus where a lot of us were and, and our coach was able to to get the weapon from him i mean all the stuff i'm you know while we're trying to we were actually at a, a track meet. We we're trying to go to sporting, but these things were happening, and they were. And and this was, this was the simplest. You know, we were just a step away from fist fights and knife fights. Weapons were relatively new, so I so I always try to think about how much more severe it is today versus what it was like then. But I, I mentioned Miller, James Miller specifically. That same coach that wrestled the weapon weapon away from him. I saw him. You know, think about every, just about everything related to my life is 50 years ago. So I, so I saw him uh, at a funeral, maybe, you know, 40 years after that or something like that. And I asked if he knew where, where Miller was. He said, yeah, yeah he's uh, uh, he's up in, he's at San Quentin. And, and he said, uh, yeah, he he runs the joint. Then I'm, and I'm thinking about, wow, this is a guy that, that I, knew that I'd be able to give rides, sort of this sort of stuff that runs runs the joint. Uh, um, so <laughs> but but at the same school, you know, the, the the great Carl Douglas, who's you know Johnny Cochran's right hand man lawyer, um, yeah. you know, some physicians, you know, the, the, it very very few people went to college out of my my class, but but you know some people were were, were very successful. Uh, on, and that way, and many were just just have been continue to be very successful, having stayed in the in the neighborhood. But but it, it you know for me it was um, you know I was fortunate enough to have uh, a 
parents that were um, uh, products of HBCUs. My, my father um, grew up in uh, Arkansas, ended up World War II. Um, I guess he was one of the beneficiaries beneficiary of the GI Bill, which we, which we now know many African Americans were not able to capitalize on, goes to Johnson C. Smith um, and then determines that he wants to go to medical school and goes to Meharry. So he has this, this amazing kind of trajectory. I have uh, Kerry with me, found after his death, this letter where after he graduated from med school, he applied for, um, uh, after an internship, a, a residency uh, at People's Hospital uh, in Akron, Ohio. And, and the letter, again, this is relevant to, to the show kind of historically, 1951, the letter says, uh, dear Dr. Shropshire, we're, we're, we're glad you applied uh, here, but uh, as you surely know, we do not hire Negroes. And uh, when we do begin to hire Negroes, it will be those who are trained in our, in our programs. So um, we found this in the garage after he passed away, kind of stored away with some other stuff. We assume he got some other letters like this. He saved this as, as the example because he ended up going back into the military for the rest of, of his training because that apparently was one of the few places where, uh, where he could, could do so. So um, uh, I really appreciate you sharing that story because I actually shared one recently uh, on my LinkedIn, it'll probably be some days since when this podcast comes out for our listeners. But there's a story that my grandfather shared with me when he was young, uh, and he was very sick, and he had to go to the hospital. That's what you do when you get sick. Right. He's in Oklahoma, and they go to the hospital, and he's not allowed to go to the front door. He can't go to the front door, so you have to go around to the back of the hospital in order to get into this hospital. And he tells a story of when he goes into the hospital, he has to walk down this stairwell. He starts walking down this long hallway. And people get sicker and sicker. And of course, they're all black people. Right. They get sicker and sicker. And it gets to the point where he passes out. The next thing you know is he wakes out on the front lawn. And I think it's such a, mm. a powerful message when you, with what you just shared. I think it just reminded me of that, that there is... Uh, this larger conversation to change it to kind of like what can be done about this, about access and opportunities, right? That yeah. what are the tactical things that we can do and organizations can do when they hear these stories of how do we translate that into action? How do we give people the access and opportunities? I think it also uh, aligns itself really well with the story you told earlier about that gentleman you knew who's in San Quentin now, right? Like what was the difference between access and opportunities that he was afforded versus others? Or is it just the decisions he made? I think it's a complex conversation. Obviously, there's not one answer and we can't just raise our hands. Oh, if he would have had this, it would have completely been different. Yeah, but yeah. I'd love to get your thought on this on, you know, what is that? How can companies look at this in, in a complex lens and come up with things to move tactically forward, especially when a large portion of the black community have these type of experience is especially with the medical field, right? right. There is this level of distrust you think of, um, I'm trying to think of that experiment. I can't think of the name off oh, the, the top of my head. Tuskegee. Uh, Tuskegee. Yeah. yeah. Like, so th these are, these are things and stories that were our grandparents were people that we could reach out and touch or, or sat on their laps. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it definitely has to be intentional, right? This, this is, I mean, the severity that you're talking about with your grandfather and I'm talking about with my father is, is, is different. And the uh, blat blatant nature of it, doesn't happen with the same frequency. Although, you know, as we're, as we're recording this, we saw the, the three uh, Tennessee legislators um, that uh, were protesting and, and the, the two that got kicked out were the two African-Americans and, and the white one <laughs> remains. So, so there's, there's a moment where we see, it, it, and all you can do is, is pause and say, okay, now, is there, is, there's gotta be some other reason. Give me, give me a further <laughs> explanation. Where yeah. you know my father and your grandfather, they there was no further explanation even even sought. It was this is this is the way that it is. So what I I tell everyone to do because I you know I even you know I've been blessed to have the opportunity to hire people and have teams of people that I have to build, and I have to ask myself if if I'm hiring all black people, well am I somehow you know should should I work on my diversity. And this is, there's a sociological 
kind of complex to that too is that that people of color tend to go overboard the 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 wrong way in terms of making sure they are being diverse. So so when I when I see myself the only team and so oh, I've got you know three black people and, and nobody else, maybe I need to to think about what I'm doing. But the idea that you have a moment of consciousness about it, the idea that you uh, do not think that you you are the one who 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 has that miracle moment. Who was colorblind? You, you are. You're the one. I'm. It's finally. It has finally occurred that I'm the one that's born and blessed uh, not to have um, the ability or to be deprived of the ability to see differences in people. So, so, so it is. How do you incorporate that thinking to to make sure that the positive is occurring and that you're not inflicting the negative? I think that's such a great point and just want to make sure I'm, I'm capturing what you're saying. It's kind of that consciousness versus policy. And sometimes those things aren't the same because I imagine the hospital may be out of policy. We don't hire Negroes. Right. That doesn't mean you can't have a moment of consciousness to, to think about, is that right? Is it right that so, that I take the uh, Socratic oath as a doctor, but when someone comes to my hospital, they can't come in through the front door. They have to go around through the back, right? That, that policy and that consciousness can be different things. And policy doesn't always uh, reflect what is uh, moral or what's right. Well, first of all, you're going to make me try to figure out, is it Hi Hippocrates or Socrates? Which oath do they take? They take one, one oath or the other. I know the Socratic method. And there's, there's some kind so of oath. You're right. It's not the same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's, that's so, number, I, number one. <laughs> but, but yeah, you, you yeah. We all need to step back more. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot. I've got to do a you know, kind of employee review thing. That, that's especially now we're moving so fast that it, it's mm -hmm. okay. And this is the old guy saying this, but it's okay to pause for a moment and go through that checklist in your head and say, "Okay, have I thought about everything? Am, am I making sure I'm not doing something that's that's negative in in, in that kind of way?" I mean, the best way to do that, and when I was at Arizona State, I had a team of, I think, 15 people or, or so, and the consciousness that I had in, in building that team, because I, I am, uh, you know, I, I'm, I, I am the worst, uh, getting better every day at uh, respecting people's pronouns. I, I am uh, the third worst at talking about people who transition and how to properly reference them. I am, I am the worst at, at making sure, um, and, and I'm the most critical of, um, uh, this is this one, I'm not the worst at, I'm the most critical of people that will just use the phrase uh, minorities or people of color, underrepresented minorities, kind of, uh, or, or diversity alone, kind of the, the, the ways to soft address issues rather than say what you mean and address the issues at hand. But I think all we, we need people around us that are engaging on these issues and that we're not taking the easy way out on what's so important at this time. I, I love that. I think that there's two things there that I want to zoom in on. One is, first of all, acknowledging that it takes a lot of courage to step out on any platform and say, I'm struggling with this and I'm working on this and this is something that I struggle with. So I think, number one, thank you for doing that. And I think it gives probably our listeners and our viewers a, a, a lot. To well, I think I think any, anybody near 70 who has not had to do that. And, and, and so many things you're like, okay, I'm done. Like, um, I am not going to add another app to my phone. You know, sort of, sort of, sort of <laughs> this, this is it. Okay, this email thing. I don't care what comes after that. I I am done. You got me doing email now. I'm not going to do anything. this text thing. I don't know. <laughs> you know. So so it it's in that way. I don't think there's there's quite often there's not ill will. It is just okay. I gotta. You know, we're talking about grandfathers again. I'm just my grandfather. You know. So I'm in. I'm a born in the uh, Negro era. My grandfather was born in in 1892 could not say in colored until until the day he, he passed away. He's referred to black people as colored, but it was, you know, that, that, that's, that's where he was in, in time. Yeah. I, it's so interesting. It, 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 
let's finish the question. Then I want to jump to something else. Cause it did make me think of just this story that I'd love to get your thoughts on. But the, the second part of what you said earlier was the softness engaging on issues in a soft way. I think it's something as practitioners, we don't necessarily talk about. I think a lot of us understand inherently when we talk about engaging uh, topics or issues softly, like using uh, people of color, dive into that a little bit more and help our listeners understand what you mean by engaging with a topic that's soft in a yeah. soft manner. Um, so, so in the university setting, <laughs> it's, it's, I mean, it's, I'm laughing just thinking about it. There's, if you listen, if you walk around and listen, there are two kinds of people. There are white people and there are underrepresented minorities. And you may not even get male, female out, out of that. Forget, forget any broader intersectionality than, than, than that. And underrepresented minorities at the, at the same university, I, could, I can walk around and ask each person who's incorporated in that. And I'll get all kinds of different answers about what people are talking about. I, I would, I, I, when I teach classes on, on these topics, I, I, and I haven't taught a class for, for a while now, the beauty of being emeritus, although I did do a guest lecture today in class, but, but I would start classes with, with two, two questions. Um, and, and this, just say it's classes related to these issues we're talking about today, uh, you know, race and the law or race and sports or wh whatever, whatever it might be, you know, gender issues in sports. The first question would be, uh, what's, what's the ideal? What, what is it that we're striving for? So to, to spend a minute to figure out, okay, we're going to do all this stuff. When will we know we're done? What, what, what is it that we're, we're trying to get to? So that, that's question number one. And no, I don't have an answer to that. So, 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 um, and number two, and this becomes very difficult to do. You cannot say in this class, minorities or people of color, you got to give whatever, whatever you, you got to give the lottery list every time. Let me know what you're talking about. And, it, you know, it's not that hard, but it's, but it's hard. And it's, you know, and we, we, a lot of times we'd end up with kids saying, and, and did I leave anybody out? Is there anything else I should should include in that uh, to get a feel for what, what people are talking about or not? So the other thing about underrepresented minorities is, um, and I've said this too, if you're going to say that, I'm going to say overrepresented majority. That's that's what I'm going to start saying. I'm, I'm you know, if we're going to, if we're going to just, just, other each other. I'm gonna give you. I'm gonna give you an other kind of phrasing, too, if you can't be specific. The the the, the last thing of you know the reason for precision and detail, and, and we're seeing this in the conversations about and reparations for one, uh, which is a whole you know that be that's a different podcast on a different channel. But but if if you're trying to figure out. Uh, and, and now there is this conversation about uh, what is it, ADOS, you know, American or African descendant of slaves, um, versus uh, first, second generation immigrants from Africa or the Caribbean or wherever else. If we're going to start really trying to be precise about issues that we're concerned about and trying to figure out the right policies for different people, is there a difference if you? immigrated to the U.S. in you know, 1962 uh, uh, as the, the child of, you know, the, the king of, you know, whatever African country you name versus you were brought here in the Middle Passage and your family after the Great Migration still lives uh, in the same neighborhood, the same, you know, lack of a better way to phrase it, the same ghetto, and you haven't found a way out. Um, now, if, if there's a uh, $50,000 reparations to be given, should be given to black people, should be given to people that are ADOS, should it be given uh, more to ADOS versus those that are recent immigrants? You know, the, the, you know, you stopped at, at 3 a.m. 
on a back road in Mississippi and you're black, you're black. I mean, we, I think we all agree on that, but there are some, some nuances to consider. It, and then we go to the Latino community and you have this a different conversation about nuances that exist there as well. So it's, it's, it's much deeper than just uh, minorities, underrepresented minorities, people of color. Um, and, and, and those, if, if we're gonna spend some serious time, these are issues that we need to, to work through. I couldn't agree more with you. I think uh, it sounds like from, from what I'm hearing, it, the pitfall is often that when we engage with a term such as people of color or underrepresented, uh, historically underrepresented groups or minorities, you as a company then look at that like, okay, we need to do something for that group. So you create an ERG right. for minorities, not realizing the individual needs within each of those groups don't necessarily all need the same solution and aren't necessarily all facing the same problem. So I think it's a, it's a really important thing that I think companies need to need to take a deeper look at. And for any of our listeners that are creating programs, it's something they really need to keep at the, at the forefront. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, just, just cause you'll hear me on podcast elsewhere, you know, lecture, I will, I will say in minorities and people of color under, you know, I'll throw that out there sometimes too. It is a, uh, a shorthand method. Sometimes it is the right phrasing to use, but sometimes I will use it, you know, inappropriately as well. Yeah, I think it's also uh, what I hear is is what I hear you saying. It, it's reiterated, I think, from all the other um, people I really look up to in this space, which is let's focus on the work. Like terms are important, and let's make sure we get those right so we understand what we're talking about. But there should be a little bit of grace when the outcome isn't. Because your outcome shouldn't always just to be use the right term. It should be what impact are we driving for these groups, yeah. right? Are we driving the correct impact? Because we can talk about what we want to call each other. And that's fantastic. And I really want to respect that and let, let's get that right. But at, at the end of the day, I, I, I want to stop facing discrimination. I think I grew up with my dad telling me uh, it, it's easy. And it, I think he got it from a letter from a Birmingham jail from MLK. That it's, it's very easy when you're not the group being discriminated against to tell that group, yeah. just wait. Just be patient. You know, if you were to do it in this manner, or if you were <laughs> to change it into today's conversation, if you were just to change the way you talk about it, if you were just to change the way you present it, then we could get change. Yeah, yeah the, the great, the great King book, you know, why we can't wait. The uh, Brown versus Board of Education, the key language in there, with all deliberate speed. I mean, yeah, that that that. If you're if you're not in those shoes in that moment, what you know what. What does it? What does that mean? What what level of patience uh, should there be? Can there be? I agree. Yeah. Well, this is fantastic. I want to transition into sports a little bit. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad you're, you're lighting it up a little bit. Is that what? We're... <laughs> yeah. yeah let's, let's bring it up. Because yeah. uh, I think there's some interesting things um, that has been at the front. You know, I'm a football guy, so obviously some of my analogies are going to be uh, about football. But I think there's there's a transition I've been seeing, having watched a lot of football between the, the past couple of years and this year, and that is more, not all, but more um, announcers being very intentional when they talk about black quarterbacks, specifically that position and the history that exists behind it. I would love your perspective when we talk, and also in coaching, when we talk about uh, the words we use to describe performance of athletes and coaches, the difference that can uh, that our words can imply when talking about these these different athletes yeah. or coaches, I mean, there's certainly there's a historic abundance of studies that that show that the more athletic phrasing, the more animal phrasing, uh, those are are likely to be referenced to the African American athlete, and the the heady, thoughtful, intelligent that's more likely to be associated with with the white athlete. I think we're at a point in time where there is a consciousness amongst uh, journalists to do better. It's yeah, I saw something today, the Pew Research, that pretty shocking. Eighty-two percent of journalists that cover sports are white. So this encompasses uh, writers and broadcasters and the like. Eighty-two percent, and it was a pretty high. I don't remember the percentage. You know, I'm, I'm a savant, but not that good. <laughs> I forget what the, but it was a pretty high percentage of that. Group is white. I mean, there's only five, five or six percent were blacks, and I don't know the, the rest of the, of the breakdown. So it's pretty, pretty, pretty striking 
uh, and, and most of them are men. So um, the idea that the language and descriptors that would be used would not be what we would want them to be is not is not surprising uh, if you're not part part of that group. That that you are even on the field of play, you're not the other in the broadcast booth or in the, the, the articles that are written, you are the other. If you are, see, now I'd have to do my laundry list if I was gonna do what I, you know, what I said you should do, if this was my classroom, but if, if you are a person of color. So. Yeah, I think, you know, what- Or a uh, woman, right, because the women are this, it's, you always know, definitely saw that in the, in the, the final four, kind of the struggles how do we deal with these women? This is, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is problematic for us. I always think it's interesting. And, and I think it's, it's one of the reasons I think data is so incredibly important to the conversation personally around diversity and inclusion, because I think some of those uh, behaviors become more evident and we can have conversations oftentimes without it coming across or the conversation oftentimes being framed as um, it's me just saying something. It's me uh, taking my opinion of maybe that I just don't like, uh, white commentators or my preferences. I always see the white commentators versus being able to see the hard number of no, 85% of commentators right. are white. So I think, um, when we look at that, how can companies take that kind of analogy of, of sports and that data and how it's used there to kind of understand how that's actually worked to change in very real sense, how broadcasters talk about black athletes, how can they take that and use that in their own companies? Yeah, I mean, that, that's that's a great question because why, why do broadcasters do it? It's because that's what they know, that's what they've heard, that's what they believe, that's because that's how they've been educated, they haven't learned otherwise. So I, so I think that's that's un, that's universal that that can cross over into the business side. I mean, you cross over into the business side of, of sports, which is a closer step to the, the business of business. <laughs> that you know the the earliest modern era trouble that we saw uh, sports leaders get into because of language was. Al Campanis on Nightline in 1987, telling Ted Koppel that blacks lacked the necessities to manage in baseball. And then when Koppel gives him a chance, he then goes into all the tropes that he has in his store. Al Campanis was the executive vice president of the Los Angeles Dodgers. Um, this is on, on the 40th anniversary of Jackie Robinson integrating Major League Baseball. So this is supposed to be a a glorious kind of celebratory conversation. So Koppel sees, wait, what's this? What is this old white guy saying? Blacks lack the necessities. So he keeps asking questions, and, and Campanis keeps digging deeper. And when Koppel breaks for a commercial, and he, he basically says, uh, "This is a great thing to Google if you have not seen this." He says, "We're going to come right back after commercial, and I'm going to give you another chance because I think you need it." And then when he comes back, Koppel says, and Campanis is sad to think of all the learnings he's had over all these years about black people. And he's gonna tell this national audience, again, this is pre-internet, this is the last newscast of the evening for America. Everybody's watching Nightline. They wanna see what this guy has to say. So Koppel says, no, no, you say they lack the necessities? What do you mean? He said, well, certainly, uh, Mr. Koppel, it's like, uh, why can't black people swim? They lack the buoyancy. So, so, so it goes on like that. But here's a guy who, uh, and, the, and the Dodgers, you know, spoiler alert, the, Do the Dodgers fire him the next day, which became kind of the pattern of what you do in these things. But here's a guy, this is a guy who grows up in, and I think he actually went to NYU, but he grows up in minor league baseball. He, he hears all this stuff. He's around all white people. These are th This is what he's learned. This is where his education has been. He's, he's now a middle-aged man. And he's got, a, he's has this platform and this, this is what, what he, this is what he says. And I mean, years later, um, I became 
friends with with Dusty Baker, who and, and Dusty, you know, the great manager of the Houston Astros now played on the Dodgers when Campanis was around. And I said something like something to Dusty like, uh, you know, and that guy, Al Campanis, I just kind of hate hatefully. And Dusty said, hey, Ken, Al was the guy that the brothers went to. Al was was a good guy. Al was just reflecting what he knew. So, you know, so 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 the idea that in, in as, as sports broadcasters, as sports business leaders, as business leaders in general, the idea that we uh, we're very careful about this education and making sure that when we give somebody the power to do things, that they really do have the information that they need to make the right kinds of of decisions. That they're not relying on you know tropes and childhood stories and 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 in some cases, you know industry practice and protocol you know how do you how do you get somebody to to the new era to the new day and so they're not caught like you know he's a good guy uh, but he's just got stuff in his head and it came out and he had the power to put it out there yeah i think it's it's such a interesting line because i think it's what i always tell people it's not my line and my dad came up with it uh but it's present be present not perfect and that's really what we're asking leaders to do like I think one of the things that I've heard that that seems very true to me is you didn't become racist or sexist in 45 minutes. It was a lifetime of experiences and reflections that you then picked up. I then can't make you unracist or unbiased or unsexed in in 45 minutes. And so it's the understanding that it's a growth process, right? That it's going to take some time to, to unlearn those and realize, oh, even though I grew up like in your example around all these guys that were saying these different things about black people, it doesn't necessarily like you need to have the progress and engage in that. And the the expectation is never that you should be perfect from day one, but the idea is you will be present and respectful. It doesn't mean it don't hold you accountable. Right? It doesn't mean you get a pass for everything, but it does mean like in order to get better, in order for us to move forward, I think we need more people remaining present, yeah. remaining engaged. Yeah, no, that, that, that's exactly right. That it's, it's, you can only be in the moment that none of us are, are perfect, that th- this is why, and, and this, you know, this gets to, you know, what big takeaways, what, you know, in, in this realm, in this classroom, this moment, big takeaway, training is not the answer. I mean, I, I hate, I hate to put people out of business because, you know, I, I don't do it, so, you know, Maybe if I did it, I'd be more defensive. Anybody that characterizes the work that they do as diversity training, I mean, maybe the RFP says that, so you got to frame it that kind of way. It's education. I mean, we're, we're, people are not dogs or seals. You're not trying to train. Okay, and whenever this happens, this is your reaction. And you get a little piece of kibble as a, as a result. No, give, give people give people credit. Give give you know that Al Campanis moment that I'm talking about. If if he had had training before he went on, that's not going to give him the depth to think about what what he needs to say in a moment with the kinds of questions that are that are being asked. So, so the I think that's so the the, the presence. Excellent. I mean, you, you're, you're so you're so right, and the idea that. If if you have the consciousness in the moment, and I, you know, and I will fail, you will fail. We got to give each other. And I, and I I I look back on, you know, Al Campanis was fired. Uh, Jimmy the Greek Snyder was fired. Similarly, a couple of years later, um, we can keep going going forward uh, to uh, some of the more recent firings. I, I I don't know. You know, I am more about the second chance in this space. Especially for people that that uh, that are in a position and want want to learn, uh, what what to try to do better. But the idea that we can put somebody in a you know you got to do five sessions with this magical trainer and, and you're going to be okay. No, it, it's a it's a it's we've got to do we got to do more than that. And I think it's such a great point when you are having for our listeners out there 
and are looking to um, start the process of bringing someone in to help you with the first inclusion. I think it's a great idea, personally. I think you need to be very strategic with what Kenneth just said, which is, are they coming in to give you a off-the-box training, or are they coming in to educate? And remember, like a lot of consultants and a lot of trainers that I've spoken with have tried to use that terminology, but it's oftentimes the business that has been tra trained themselves or, or learned themselves that what, what I really want is a training. So you need to look deeper. What are they trying to do? Are they trying to install? Because what we do here at Cape, we call them trainings, like Kenneth would hate us. But what we try to install is an organizational change method to move forward, right? We're trying to say, can we educate you to a system that will allow you to continue the progress of journey? Our job is not to train you. I'm not going to, that's why we say like, I'm not going to show up in a session, take the guy who you know, or the girl who you know, or they who you know, that is being sexist, racist, or in, insert your uh, behavior here and make them not racist. The point is, can we teach everyone how to engage consistently in difficult conversations, embrace the tension that lies in trying to get things right while not crucifying anybody who gets yeah. it wrong because we want to be present not perfect and kenneth i think you said it so so brilliantly there um i really really appreciate and, and, that and, and no no hate to uh using the, the training language but the, the one of my colleagues here at, at warden who is is one of the best uh stephanie creary uh uses that language all the time i, I joke with her she, she knows i'm, I'm gonna, gonna say this but it but it's, she's not doing the dog training thing that i'm talking about the if you bring us in, we we will yeah. get the, you, this is your your problems are solved, and and you don't need you don't need to do anything yeah. else. It's it's these are the five steps, and we're done. It. I wonder what you think about this. Is a comment I hear quite a lot, and and I, I, I'm not sure how I feel about it. But some practitioners will, will use the phrase, "I am working, so I'm trying to work myself out of a job." Is what it culminates, right? Like after I'm done, like you won't need me, and. There's a sense of me that, that, that appreciates this, the, the sentiment that, that, that lies inside of that, which is living in this idyllic world where bias and understanding and inclusion really is, is at the center of it. But there's another part of me that feels like, to a certain extent, that statement ignores the reality of an ever-changing society that is constantly moving forward and the problems evolve as we move forward, that we'll never quite get to that point. And that's the beauty of it, right? As a society, we evolve and we'll need to... Uh, change and adapt for new generations and, and the problems that they're facing or trying to tackle. But would love your, your thought on kind of that concept of when yeah. that's said, what you take away from it. I mean, so you take me back by, by saying that, and there, and there are a lot of opportunities where people say, you know, I'm successful when I work myself out of, out of business. That, that you, you know, what you bring me back to this, again, this would be a whole completely different show. But that's, that's at the heart of, of critical race theory. That, that Derek Bell, one of the, the key um, deliverables that, that he provided is we can't talk about this unless we accept that racism is permanent, the permanence of racism. And that that's striking to think about, that I, I feel like generationally we're getting better, but, but then as we describe, a lot of people are getting slicker. A lot of things are happening. A lot of this you know, Trump era exposure of oh, it was it was there all along. We just didn't see it. But it but it does seem that, that things are getting better. But the the stake in the ground that Derek Bell uh, and the origi originators of critical race theory uh, gave us is that racism is permanent. So start building from there. And it's a lot of what I write about is this idea. We I, I did a lot of work with the the Rooney Rule in the, in the NFL, and the idea that you have to be vigilant and agile, and 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 ready to deal with it with it constantly. That that the uh, you know what, what are the firefighters concerned about? Are the embers going to come back up again? You know, you think you think you got it. Yeah. You know, the, the bar of soap in the bathtub. Well, it slipped away again. So um, yeah. That that's that's what you know. I, I would like to be more optimistic, and Derek Bell's words are are daunting, but I think they they remain true. Yeah, I think I think it is a good 
premise to start with. And I appreciate that clarity for me because I think it is it's something I struggle with. Like I I, I understand that the idealism and, and the want to believe in that, but also the realism of understanding like each generation will have new things. I think an, an excellent example of, of what this new generation will have to face is there's this insidious thing around alpha male culture, which is right. thinly veiled sexism, just thinly veiled. Well, if you're a real alpha male, your women will submit to you. And it's this conversation, this dialogue that we were having 50 years ago that now has been put into this insidious nature where it do, they don't outright say, oh, well, of course I respect women. But I just believe, you know, in, in a real relationship, this is how it should be. And I think this will be some of the things this new generation will be facing where it's, it's a little bit more insidious. It's a little bit more slippery. And you really have to understand, I think, the underlying societal cogs of, okay, but why is what they're saying? Because you may have an understanding of, okay, that doesn't feel right. Like you shouldn't be saying that, but it takes a better understanding of sociology really in our society to understand what are they really saying? What's the history behind right. kind yeah. of what those people are getting at? Well, Kenneth, uh, I'm going to preface and queue up kind of our last question here. And the last question is, what is the missing piece for diversity, equity, inclusion? We know there's not one piece. There are many. But what's the one thing you want our viewers and listeners uh, to be thinking about and take away? Uh, you know, I'm going to go back to Derek Bell again. That, that uh, uh, Since I brought him up, that, that he's always a good resource. Um, Professor Derek Bell, I think one of the earliest pieces in, in writing about this whole space so that really what we're seeking is convergence that that we need to have the interest converge of all parties concerned and if you're trying to find solutions you need to strive for that interest convergence and you need to highlight where the interests come together so why why is it a good idea to to do these things, to to have a diverse board, to uh, to have women at the highest level of the company, that the interest con interest convergence for one person in leadership might be um, the bottom line and profitability, and, and provide them with studies that show that. Don't don't be uh, so shy or arrogant or whatever it is to say, if it's not a hearts and minds decision, I don't want them to make it. But for others, that that's going to be that's where the interest will converge. That that people will feel good, and they'll say, "I see that provides happiness uh, for a group of people I haven't traditionally supported." So I will do it, and I will support that. So for people to think more about again that foundational piece that, that Bell put forward to us, interest convergence, and to operate in that kind of way. Well, Kenneth, thank you so much uh, for coming on the podcast. Do you have any, uh, where can people find you and what kind of upcoming events uh, do you have that our viewers should be uh, be aware of? Um, as, you, as you know, at the outset, so I just uh, took over as uh, the senior advisor to the dean at the Wharton School. So you can find me at the Wharton School uh, uh, pretty easily. Um, just go to the website, and look for me. And we're just getting underway with this coalition for equity and opportunity. And, and the thing that I'll say, I'll leave people with the, the Dean is very serious about this being a coalition and for finding ways to work with people to deliver what it is a business school should be doing on equity and opportunity in the broadest sense. So all those different uh, races and genders, all those, I want you to name everybody to fall under that. Uh, and, and also very serious about trying to deliver best practices to business and to learn from business what practices have worked to address these issues of equity and opportunity. Thank you for listening to Finding Diversity, The Missing Piece. You can expect new episodes monthly. And if you like the show, please subscribe and leave a review wherever you get your podcasts. This helps others like you find the show. Finding Diversity, The Missing Piece is powered by Cape Inclusion. It's produced by Studio Deed Podcast Production, directed by Prescott Wong and hosted by me, Justice Thompson. To learn more about how you can get started and to book a demo, visit us at capeinclusion.com.